time to talk some shit. Power style. You listening to the power movement. Welcome to the power movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week I headed to the Midwest for the semen wedding. It was an explosion of fun that you could see on everyone's faces all weekend. Man, it is fun to talk about that wedding. Anyways, before I headed out to Minnesota, I reached out to legendary Minnesota-based filmmaker Eric Iberg to meet him for the first time. It's crazy that I've sponsored his projects, we know a ton of the same people, but I've never met him in person. So it was kind of a blind date, and it's safe to say I scored. I made a new friend and had an awesome conversation with a true ski historian. Before we get into the podcast, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram at The Powell Movement, tell your friends about the show, and shoot me an email if you have any guest suggestions or just want to share something. My email is mike at the Powell Movement, and I will get back to you. I also want to thank my awesome sponsors who make this show happen. They are Evo, Rescue Water, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Now, let's talk to Eric Iberg. So it is a blazing hot day here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm sitting with Eric Iberg, who is a legend in the ski world. He's a legendary filmmaker. And these days, he's almost disappeared off the map for the past four or five years. You've heard of his Inspired Media Concepts brand that was all about sports and positivity. But you haven't really heard about Iberg. And it's because you haven't been in this country. Hi, Eric, first. And what have you been up to the past few years? It hasn't even been two years since I I released Be Inspired, but that's how fast the internet makes you think someone's gone. Yeah, no, I guess I've been in Denmark the last five years with my wife and kids, and and now I'm back in Minnesota right now. You had mentioned it was you were going to try to live in Andorra. You met with the president of Andorra. No, not the president, just a head family of the country. Head family of the country. You're going to start a TV channel, but... That didn't happen, and you're here today. So what's a day in the life of Eric Iberg, who now lives back in Minnesota? Wake up at 5.30 to 6 when my kid yells, and then I take my little boy out of the crib. We go downstairs, and we hang out for a couple hours. My wife's already gone at the gym, probably at like 4.30 or 5. And then she gets back at like 9. She works as well there, so it's not just a four-hour workout for her. But gets back at nine, then we high five and I go up into my office, do work until about 1130, phone calls, emails, then high five again. I grab baby, put him to sleep. And then uh, that should take about 20 minutes or so. And then I go do work till about five or so. And then I put some food in myself, play with some kids, put some kids to sleep, jump back on the phone and computer at nine till about midnight or one o'clock and then start it all over at 536. And we right now are not at your property because you live on the banks of Lake Minnetonka or somewhere in that vicinity, but we are at your safe house. We are at a place where you can go to escape the madness of two children. Yes, I'm privileged enough. I have uh, friends that I grew up with have a place and they have jobs and they go to every day and I can come here and not have kids on the other side of the wall or jumping on me while I'm talking to lawyers or doing other business meetings or stuff like that. Now, I don't know your friends, and they're not here. I didn't get to meet them. But these guys, how old are they? 38 and 36, 37. And they are living every 17-year-old's fantasy. It's like two best friends. I'm looking around. I see neon beer signs, rolling rock flag, putters, Two flat screen TVs stacked on top of each other. This is the best ghetto like you've seen in the movies, like two TVs on top of each other. Yeah. But that was like box set time. You've never seen two flat screens on top. Here's who these guys are. Their records on the wall are Frantman Comes Alive, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Huey Lewis, and the News Sports. They actually have it up there, and I don't even think it's ironic. Air Supply, Jefferson Starship, and Neil Diamond. Who doesn't love Neil Diamond? But I got Wheaties box of the championship, 87 and 91 twins. Speaking of that, this is kind of a loser city in sports, right? Other than that, you guys have had nothing to be excited about. Do you hate women? No. We won like five WNBA championships in a row. Aren't they considered professionals? Yeah. Sorry. And congratulations. So this city <laughs> is dominant in women's basketball. In other sports, you've had professional teams who have had a drought. 
since all teams combined since like 19, what was that year? 91, I was 11. Okay. So that was the last time our state, other than women's sport, that we won a, like, say, traditional sport championship. I think we went to three Super Bowls in the 70s or 60s where we lost every time in a row. But our, our big claim to fame that no one knows is if you ever wondered why the LA Lakers are Lakers, well, they originally come from Minnesota. So they were the Minneapolis Lakers from like the 20s or the 10 until the 59, I believe. And then they wanted to feel like winners. So they moved to California. Well, they won five in a row in Minnesota before they won to LA. So we actually hold that team actually for basketball. Minneapolis Lakers had five in a row in the 50s. Are you excited for the Vikings this year? If they make it to the Super Bowl. Because, I mean, it's just like you grow up for the whole idea that the Vikings, queens, you know, they're going to always become like they're not going to win it. But they've been so close the past few years. I guess, man. I'll believe it when I see it. Like ever since it had to have been January 99 when we lost to the Falcons, I think. And I only remember it because I was at a junior national mogul event in Bogus Basin. And the guy on the loudspeaker at the bottom of the mogul event would announce the sp- or whenever a touchdown or a field goal happens. So that's the way I consumed the first Minnesota NFC championship game in my life. And it was wicked. And so like the kick, like you heard about, you're like, Vikings are going to win. Vikings are going to win. And all of a sudden they're like, they missed the kick. And you're like, that motherfucker hasn't missed a kick all year. (laughs) And I'm sitting at the bottom of the mogul course watching like 14 year old Tanner do 360s. And are you born and raised in Minnesota? Yeah, I was born and raised in Edina, Minnesota till 18 and then went to to Utah for university. And I've heard of Edina. Anybody from the Twin Cities area, if you bring up that city's name, cake eater eventually comes out. That word, what is a cake eater? All I've ever gathered of it is in the time of the Depression, I guess rich people could eat cake and because it, you needed sugar or something. And so the idea of eating cake from what I've learned, I don't know. I didn't verify it. I just was always confused at being called a cake eater when I left my city. Uh-huh. And yeah, and I guess that's where it came from. Like, United people could eat cake during the Depression. And it's always been an upper class kind of area, I guess. Did you live that upper class kind of life growing up? No. My mom comes from like a place up in Stearns County called Gray Eagle. It's like population 150. She has 12 brothers and sisters. And then my dad comes from Rochester. So my mom was like farm person, all this shit. My dad was like, his dad worked for IBM World Headquarters in Rochester since day one. And then my dad did the same, never missed a day of work. So that was kind of like everything was about checks and balances. And so they figured out the way into Edina. They never overspent. My mom didn't have her driver's license to like 30. You know, like, so it was just about what do you need in life? And then it was minimalistic. And then most important things of health and taking care of education was put there. And we got in Edina. So you, you didn't answer me at all. Did you get a car when you were 16? No. Did all your friends get a car? Yeah. The dopest shit you ever seen. Like everyone had like new Z71s like at age 16. Like the high school parking lot was just like epic. Who was the most ridiculous house that you went to? What was it like? There's a barbecue place called Famous Dave's. Yeah, I've heard of it. And so the family, like they're Native American. So like growing up, I knew the kid. He was two years older than me and my sister's age. And, like, he'd always play with me and my friends. He lived by one of my good friends. And, like, they didn't have much or whatever. But then this dad created Famous Dave's and also was part of the casino boom in the early 90s. And so all of a sudden, Famous Dave's, the barbecue place blew up. Casinos blew up. Motherfucker has, like, a replica Chicago Bulls basketball court in his basement. Well, yeah, it's just nuts. I don't know. There's some fucked up shit around here. I guess that's better than having friends who grew up in crack houses. Those are fun, too. I mean, you ever seen a packing pallet room in a crack house? That's a bizarre world. Have you seen a packing pallet room in a, in a yeah, crack house? It's more of heroin people that just put the needle in and then like fucking like to lay out in some crack house. And, I don't know. It's a bizarre world. Some Halloween when I came back here when I was young. I was actually with Shane and uh, John Schmidt at that event. I'm just confused. So you were at a crack house? You called it an event, but you were at a crack house and I then there were heroin people? I mean, it was uh, Halloween. I was back. After I moved out west already, I went with Shane Nelson and, and John Schmidt. And they're like, oh, let's go to this crazy place. And when I was just like, where the fuck are we? So like we go walk up the house. It's like early 1900s house. And it's just like windows were out, everything like this. And like, but there's shit going on, like 100, 200 people in it. And so like go up the stairs and then you can get up the attic and the attic windows were open and people were just like sitting on the rooftops. And like, I've just never been to this place in Minneapolis before. 
And so I'm like, this is awesome. And then like went down, we're like, let's go party downstairs. So open a door and it's just full of packing pods and people lay in there. I'm like, what the fuck is that? And then they're like, oh man, I just the people that are strung out that are shooting up heroin and stuff, like they just lay out in there for a couple hours. I was like, well, that's bizarre. And I was Flavor Flav on Halloween too. And I had my wisdom teeth out and I wasn't drunk or high. It was awesome. Have you ever smoked crack? Never. What I did is I did a social experiment once in 2004 and I had TJ Schiller go up on the glacier because I wasn't going up on the glacier because I got done what I needed, but I was in town for two weeks. And so people were like, where's Iberg? Why doesn't he ever come out? So I'm like, tell people you saw me doing crack in the skate park. And I want to see how many people believe it. Because if you know me, I'd never do crack. And so it was kind of fun. I spread a rumor that I did crack once and it went pretty far. And I had people like come up to me like eight months later and be like, dude, I'm worried about you. I'm like, you're worried about me. Found out I did crack eight months ago. Could have killed myself by now. So no, the answer is no. I don't do crack. Never done crack. Crack is whack, especially if you're a teen. Word up. I said about tobacco too. I didn't start tobacco until I was 20. So you were a late bloomer with tobacco. Yeah. And weed and alcohol. Wow. Midwest growing up has to be miserable for a kid other than if you're a skier and then still miserable on the cold days. How do you get into skiing? Is your family into it or is it just your babysitter? First of all, you you don't know something's whack if you don't experience something else. I've experienced the Midwest. I know, but I'm saying like if you don't leave somewhere and you don't have cable television, you don't have internet, you don't know what you don't have. So growing up was epic. Like everything about it, every second that like whether it was school, whether it was church, whether it was sport whether it was my jock baseball friends being like, why do you hang out with your burnout ski friends? Whether it was like crackhead friends and like jock and GQ, like every single thing you saw, like I had the best time of my life. Like it was not best. I have the best time of my life every day, but I'm just saying, looking back with no responsibilities, that time period, let's say that no responsibility, best time period. You know, like when you don't, you live at your parents' house, everything was awesome. And skiing, I got into, I actually didn't like it growing up because I played basketball. So my friends that skied, they'd be like friends that only went to Colorado once a year. So like it was posh talk. It wasn't like how you talk about basketball or baseball or football. It was like, oh, we went to Vail for a fucking week over Christmas. I never flew on an airplane. Nothing sounded that cool about me. So I wasn't turned on by the sport. Just like I wasn't turned on by golf. I was like, what fucking lazy fucking prick sport? You know, like I didn't like it. I was tall in basketball, so I could hang out under a rim and fucking go like this over kids for until I was at least 12. Did you play high school sports too? By high school, I I was just baseball and skiing. And basketball so. coach hate you? No, I just fell in love with skiing. Like all of a sudden, my neighbor started skiing and we were pretty much similar kind of backgrounds and whatever. And so we started going with each other, sharing rides, like fifth, sixth grade. And so I was still playing basketball, but I, I fell in love. I mean, it all of a sudden became, if I wasn't playing basketball, I'm going from 3 till 10 o'clock at night, every school night, unless my parents come home and you don't have homework in 5th and 6th, you didn't at that time. And then like weekends, we're doing 13 fucking hours on 128 vertical feet. Once again, it goes, if you don't know any better, how fun is that to be outside, to slide around, to find things to jump off of? Yeah. Go, pretend like we're going through the woods. We're like, you want to go? Like, we didn't know a backcountry. We didn't even watch ski movies at that time. So you didn't even think what you didn't have. You know, like it just goes on and on. And so then as soon as skiing was just beyond fun, I found a freestyle team, which was like one of a handful at the time at the ski hill I went to. And when I was 13, I joined that and I quit basketball. So it was more just for love of that a hundred times more than being inside. What year did you graduate? 98. Were you just all hip hop in high school? It seems like today there's a lot of hip hop and yeah. reggae in your influences. I fell in love with hip hop when I was like eight. I mean, I think like pretty much fuck the police when I was like an eight year old. I remember I brought an easy does it tape on my Walkman in school and I played it and I got it from my cousins and I had to go to the principal's office because some kids said that there were swear words on the headset that I was listening to. But yeah, from then I was just like, I was hooked on every set. Like I have a scrapbook where I'd cut shit out that was in my dad's news weeks. Cause this time, like you had like creation of the parental advisory. Yeah. And that was Tipper Gore's big thing that she's leading. So it was in the news. Easy E like was going to fucking like charity dinners at George Bush shit in 91, you know? So he'd go spend $5,000 a plate for a presidential campaign. And then they would interview him. They're like, why are you here? Why are you here? He's like, I just paid $5,000 for a plate. I'm going to get a million impressed tonight. 
And you're like, yo, this guy's motherfucker. And then he got buried in a gold casket when he died of AIDS. Like, you're just like, what the fuck is this shit? So I, I fell in love and then like, it was almost like my nightly news. And I was like, what is this culture that I am not in? And at the same time, you don't smoke weed. No, not at all. I didn't drink. I was so into it though. Like they had a cream sodas at Target that were like 40 bottles and they were clear and I'd get those all the time. Like I'd fucking like at baseball, I'm like, yo, we got to get 40 water. And so like uh, that was our whole shit. Like it made everyone number 40 on the team for all our shit. Like I just loved the culture so much, but I was not part of it and I didn't want to infiltrate it, but I loved it. It was just bizarro world. You dying at gangsters? Not even trying to be gangsters, just loving a culture. We made a movie, an art of film called What You Got of My 40 Homie when I was 17. At four minutes and 20 seconds into the movie, we just stopped. We were all 18. So we got a Swisher Sweet and we just smoked it normal. We didn't break it open. We didn't do that. And you're not <laughs> inhaling. I didn't smoke cigarettes either at the time or anything. And so we just, for one minute, we just passed around a Swisher Sweet. But in the video, you made it look like weed and it just played the Cypress Hill song, Wanna Get High. And my teacher's just like, what? So you got marked down for any use of drugs, profanity or whatever. And we got an A on our 25-minute movie, but then we got marked down to an F after all our profanity and all our shit. It was epic. So that's where the whole movie-making process starts for you, is whatever your 40 movie is? It was a mix, because as soon as part of my falling in love with skiing was ski movies. Like, I remember, so say, like, as soon as I saw my first ski movie at my neighbor's house, I think it was, like, Requiem for a Dream. You know, or something like that. Like, I bugged the fuck out. Like, we would watch it. I'd sleep over his house. We'd watch. And it's an hour and a half. And I'd watch it twice or something. Like, what the fuck? And then he got Blizzard of Oz. I was like, this is bizarro world. And so after that, like, I fell in love. So say 1993. So when I'm like 13, 14, I'd only get one Christmas present. And that video, right? Like, 45 bucks of VHS at this time period. So like, you're ordering from Maine, wherever Stump's selling his shit out of. And so I'm like, I just want this. They're like $45 for a VHS move, my friend. You only get one gift. Yeah, well, it's $45. It's more about the value of what's going on here. First one I got in 94, it was, um, the fuck, what is the one where Plake Mono skiing naked? Dr. Strange Glove. So Dr. Strange Glove was my first one I got, like 14. And I remember watching this, like, before we went to church, because I got, we got open presents before dinner, and we did early dinner and then church, and I'm watching it. And I'm watching, like, Glenn Flake with this guy with mohawk monoskiing naked in a sand dude with my family in Minnesota. And they're, like, bugged out. And I'm like, yo, this is, I want to bug people out. So that was part of it. And then I always had a, a little Hi8 camera that a friend would own or whatever. And we'd film our aerial jumping at night to check out our shit. And then you'd see UFOs from Shane Nelson. You'd see all this shit that was unique. I saw poachers when I was 16. So I saw a guy do 540s and switch 540s and all of this at my own hill. And then follow cams were nonstop. We're on a tow rope and fucking filming so much. And then even then I went to university to play baseball. So it wasn't there. It was more of when I couldn't pick up my arm. And I was like, well, what the fuck do I do now? And I was like, what do I love? I love skiing. I love fucking filming shit. And I love fucking getting reactions. So after two weeks of like just bugging the fuck out. And then I was like, I'm quitting school. Buy a camera, make a movie. you? Did you buy a camera? I did. I found a VX1000 when I came back for thanksgiving so i knew i was gonna quit like end of october like already at this time i was like met tanner he's like 14 right before his 15th birthday i'm like yo i'm gonna quit school let's make a ski movie and shit like i got this guy and this guy already live here holmes is jt is living right down the dorm way i got john turkula in minnesota like i live with zach Mertz, you know him i got the Schraub brothers it's just kind of funny like that whole thing and then it kind of went from there came back here found like a display model Or whatever. Still fucking gnarly investment. But I just spent like fucking $9,000 on three and a half months of university. And I wasn't playing baseball anymore. And I was like, yo, that was a fucking waste of goddamn money. Well, I've heard that you're one of the guys who has gotten through it all without ever having to make the large investment in the more modern camera. Do you own a camera now? Well, here's a funny story. So when I pitched my first movie, this is a movie called Wreck the Snowman by 40 Ounce Productions. This is 98, 99. I was like, yo, like, this is a brand new sport. You know, like, I'm on fucking F-17s, 210s, you know, no twin tips, mm-hmm. hearts. Tanner's on F-17s, like, fucking 130, <laughs> you know, he's a midget. And so, like, everyone who's doing these tricks, like, there is no twin tip, really. He's still doing moguls. This is before the second U.S. Open and all this shit. So, when I'm making up this movie now, and so I'm looking at the whole sport, I'm like, it's brand new. 
you got poor boys, so they just had their shit. And they were on top of everything, I feel like, at that point. Kind of, but you also had Mikey Hill, who just came out with uh, Not Super, his first one was Skeen's Last Stand, 97, 98. And then you also had Austinus just busted on the scene with Clay Pigeons. So the shit was epic, actually, what was going on. So I'm evaluating, I'm like, all right, Austinus uses 8mm, fucking shit, fucking kind of hurt my head. You know, like, as far as the lighting and everything goes that... I'm like, Johnny's using this fucking mini DV shit. That shit's like expensive, you know? And then I'm looking at uh, all the other stuff. I'm like 16. I'm like, why? It don't make sense. I'm like, this is a brand new sport. No twin tips. Where's the investment? No one's being invested in. So I know Brad Fayfield. He's from Minnesota. His last year of freestyle skiing was my first year. And then he was good friends with my coach, who was 10 years older than me. That was really good friends. Is he from Medina? No, I don't know where he's from. Because he comes from a lot of... He yes. started free skier, right? I mean, he started Storm Mountain Publishing. Okay. So <laughs> he started the publishing company and then also the magazine. Because he was into it and he wanted to do it back in 97? No idea. All I know is it was kind of a crossover from XM, Extreme Mogul, which was around for one year in 96, 97, which was Chris Tamburini's magazine out of Tahoe which was after Boards in Motion, 95, 96, that only lasted a year or two in Tahoe. So Tamburini, he was kind of like the guy who was already in the magazine. Fayfield was like into the mogul scene. And like, I think he knew Cindy Crawford because his business partner who helped start the magazine, Patrick Crawford, was Cindy's cousin. And then he knew Mosley well. And so he's like, we got hot supermodel. We got Olympic gold medalist. We got a launch. We got this new sport. Shit's hot. Free skiing. You know, it just at right time, right place, right investment, whatever. But going back to Fayfield, so I was like, all right, I know this guy. Like, I guess you got to get sponsors. I need his magazine sponsor first. So I wrote him a pitch to do my first movie called Wreck the Snowman on a high eight. Because I was watching skateboard movies in high eight. I was watching rollerblade videos in high eight. And I was like, these are a lot of big industries. And so he got back. He's like, ah, dude, we need to be the best. So if we're going to sponsor something, we got to align with the best kind of quality. If we're the best paper, we want the best film quality. Yeah. And so like, I'm like, all right, it makes sense, you know? And so like, I, I filmed all that year and I ended up getting that VX 1000 after that Fayfield talk, you know, instead of doing high eight, cause I had a high eight from my dad from a long time ago. That's why I brought it up. Cause I'm like, this is what I have for nothing. No investment. How do I continue? And so I invested and then filmed the whole year, but still this time I never edited nothing. You know, first time filming like for a concept and idea and I had awesome concepts and athletes, everything. I f- drove out, like filmed the Shrobs in Wisconsin twice. Whatever happened to those guys? So the Shrobs were an enigma. They had like three months in the ski world where they were super popular. You saw them in magazines and they'd have like a big jump on their flat backyard with like a straw landing uh, and snow. And then they just... Our sport evolved so fast that you couldn't be a sideshow at the beginning. If you wanted to be a sideshow, the voices were louder to get the fuck out, you know? And so, like, you know, when he came out and swinging with, like, Adam or Luke, say, a double Misty 1440, right? More people think that's cool today, where almost 99% of the people, when he did it, you know, they're like, why, why are you double flipping? Why don't you go to aerials? You know, and then all of a sudden you see a sideshow where they're doing Warren Miller, and, like, everyone's trying to create their own thing. And they're like, what the fuck? Why are you doing Warren Miller? Why don't you, like, be part of something cool? So, like, this list of things that they were doing to get theirs, being they weren't looking at being part of a scene. They were looking at just skiing and loving it, living in Wisconsin. And since they didn't get part of the scene, they weren't kind of accepted for the way they wanted to go. Because double flips weren't cool. And we made sure of it, even through Mikey Wilson in 2006. The only person that could make it cool was... PK fucking doing one that there was no denying. And then Yoon being the popular guy while PK was injured and winning the next games. So that's it. But other than that, we've fucking fought for 10 years plus to make sure we said we weren't aerials. Yeah. And I would say doubles have changed in look and feel too. They look a lot. But we stopped the progression. You know, we stopped the idea of a different grab or a different tweak or a different driver. We said, no, man, slow it down. Well, I wish it would slow down now because it's sped up very, very, very fast. But. But the Shrobs are killing it. They run a thing called M-Snow. So it's recycled plastic from like street cones and shit like that for a skiable slope or tubing slopes. And then they, I think they both work at a hill that I think Adam or Luke Shrobs' wife's family owns in Michigan. So still they're fucking killing it, right? Like they do movie premieres for different companies. They have 
rail events. They run a small hill. They have try to make sure people can do backyard rail contests and setups every year to give away their products. So they're still as stoked on skiing as they were 25 years ago. It's like almost famous in skiing, which means they almost aspired to make eight grand a year, but they didn't. Speaking of making money, I'm going to take a break real quick. Talk about my sponsors. Sounds like you're going to take a break as well. And my first sponsor is Evo. And I always tell you how great their in-store experiences are in Denver, Seattle, and Portland. And I always tell you how you can save 10% off on your Evo.com order when you use the code capital TPM, the number 10, when you check out. Or you can mention it in stores when you're checking out to get that 10% off. But one thing I don't talk about enough is Evo Trip Adventure Vacations. Yes, Evo creates vacations to amazing adventure destinations with rad people. It's a once-in-a-lifetime way to experience snow and culture. It's the foundation of what Evo is all about, and now is the time to plan for your Evo trip to Japan this winter. Experience Japan firsthand with some awesome people on your Evo trip. You can find out more about Evo trip over at evo.com, and you can save up to 70% off your gear for that trip right now during Evo's Labor Day sale. Rescue Water is my next sponsor, and they are all about proactive recovery. What does that mean to you? Well, think of it like this. If you're really tired, you skip the coffee and grab an energy drink. Well, if you really need to hydrate, like when you're done a workout or get off the hill or trail, skip the sports drink and drink a cold rescue water. It replaces electrolytes much better than anything else you've ever used to hydrate. It's science and it works. I make it work for me after big nights at the bar. Let me tell you, one rescue water before bed and I'm hangover free in the morning. Make Rescue Water work for you by heading over to rescuewater.com to save 20% on a 12-pack case with the code R-E-S-Q-WATER-T-P-M. Rescue Water is also available on Amazon. My final sponsor brews beer, drinks beer, and wants everyone to drink beer outside. They're the 10-barrel brewery based out of Bend, Oregon, and they are all about supporting action sports and the people that love them. They also happen to make some of the best beer in the world. If you haven't had a 10-barrel, you're missing out. I love the out-of-office Pilsner, but really, I'm happy with any of the beers. They're all really tasty. Next time you head to the store, pick up some 10-barrel and see what I'm talking about. And if you happen to be in Bend, Portland, Denver, Idaho, or San Diego, pop into one of the 10-barrel brew pubs, order a flight, and pick your favorite. Support the beer that supports action sports, the 10-barrel brewery. Find out more at 10barrel.com. Those are my sponsors, and we are back and I guess the defining moment in your career, and it's not a moment, it's a, a movie, is royalty. There's other movies, but I think that puts you on the map globally of like a progressive video that showcases the lifestyle. But really what that movie does is it has so much talent that it's ridiculous. And I think something you've been able to do is always to see talent in other people and align yourself with the best. You had Candide, The Three Phils, Pollard. Mikhail, you had all these different dudes. How are you getting all these guys in like your second film? How do you get them to be part of your projects, especially that early when they don't know who you are? I guess it's it's friendship shit. So like I'm pretty straightforward on everything. If you wanted to create and work hard, and I think a lot of the thing is a lot of these guys, no first time I ever think about this, like a lot of these guys want direction. Because what their 100% goal is, is to create on skis. So a lot of the times when they'd have a problem, or most of the times, it's just like a problem that they like bummed on and then they move on because they want to go back to skiing. And so what I kind of brought was that like, oh, you hated the song they used in your ski movies? Talking to my friends. And then be like, okay, well, you hated this or that? Well, just make your fucking own. And then, well, they're not going to go do it on their own, but... If someone's doing everything for them, but doing what they want. So what I kind of brought to the table was how do you want to be portrayed where everyone else was saying, this is how we're going to betray you. We need product shots. We need this. You can only have this much time because it was paid for. You don't fit into this scene because of these sponsors. So I was kind of the only guy ever really to handpick people. And so, you know, all this added up, you know, it's kind of shows loyalty to what you kind of dedicate your life to what you could die for every year so i'm like you know what i'm going to live my life for you over the next year and that kind of sells people i think on the idea to live for myself 
Like, all right, let's go. You're going to put a camera in front of me every day. You're going to have your phone ring all day, every day from my sponsors and then try to get money from other people to promote me and then do all this shit and help me on this and that and this. And the list goes on and on and on. And we were able to friendship and business. I was able to bring something because it was real. And if it didn't benefit them, then there was no point in me even doing anything to benefit myself. Over the years, everybody you've worked with seems to be like a list if you were to put them in letters. But who are the guys that you think you've had the most influence and probably had as much as influence on you as well? Who are the guys? I mean, it started with Tanner, you know, like as far as like my really like, okay, this is what I'm going to do and where he figured out this is what I'm going to do for himself. I moved to Utah from Minnesota to go to University of Utah when I was 18. He just moved down from Montana when he was 14 to begin Park City Winter School or Mountain School the next spring. So he was just about to become full-time, I'm going to the 98 Olympics as a mogul skier mentality, 14 years old. When I had first had my camera, like I filmed him at mogul events at Alta, and then this, and then we went to the US Open for the first time. He got fourth that last week of January, and then we went to the Jim Moran event. We did a bunch of other filming stuff. But then he won the Jim Moran event, slope style event, a birthhood pass. And so he beat like all the illest dudes, like Toby Dawson, like Mosley was there, but he wasn't skiing. Didvig was there. So like to see Tanner in 99 beat like these guys that are the big guys in Johnny's movies and all that. And then in contests as well, you're like, holy. And they all dominated Tanner and moguls. He beat Evan Didvig. He beat Toby Dawson. He beat Ryan Riley. He beat Willie Boyle. I could go on for days about who was the shit of all shit that he beat in moguls mm-hmm. that day. And you're just like, and then he's like, I'm done. So Tanner for sure and his work ethic. And then the three fills, like just every single thing about like working together with them was amazing. And still like to this day, I work with Phil Bellinger and shit like that on different things. And then I don't know, Kai is huge still to this day, like working with him since he was 13. You worked with the Pettit brothers since they were really young, too. Yeah, with Sean and um, Callum. Like, Sean with a sense of love at the same time as Kai, right? So yeah. Kai was 13. Kai just dealt a little bit more with. And then he was kind of like the head boss of the kids. And then Callum and Sean. So Callum was 13 as well, and Sean was 11. And so that was the year that we all traveled together. It was the wildest. Like, I'm filming ski movies at 24. Like, I'd come back here, talk to my sister, She's like, oh, what'd you do? And I was like, oh, I was with like an 11 year old and 13 year old and I'm 23, 24. And she's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, like, this is weird, right? I'm like, it's not weird. It's totally normal. You know, but to like everyone here, they're just like, you do what? You smoking from? I'm like, yeah. And then I tell them the side effects if they try to smoke and what they do and how it's bad for them and the consequences they can pay. And they're like, that's just bizarre. I'm like, yeah, but it's real. Check it out. Those kids were more adult and professional than you were at 11, probably. I would- no, Kai was the man of his house. Sean was awesome because during dub ski, once he forgot his boots after we went to the mountain, got snow, went to Portland. And then I was looking at Callum and Kai and I'm like, where's Sean? And they're like, he's crying in the van. Yeah, it was the best. And he's just crying. I go, what the fuck? Why are you crying? It looks like he's like seven years old, six years old. He's like, I forgot my boots. (laughs) But then at the same time, like Tanner a week before forgot his skis or something in the back country, Utah and punched my whole van up. So I was like, this is awesome, man still like little kids no matter what they were little kids but sean was a kid at 11 that i remember the first time i went to a thai restaurant was with him and some other people i'm like i don't even know what to order here and he's like trust me man if you're not sure you get chicken satay you're gonna be good (laughs) and i was like i'm not even listening to this 11 or he was not even 11 at that point he was younger i think deb was there with him and I didn't order what he had, and I'd order Envy. I'm going to see him in a couple of weeks. I'm going to put him on the podcast in a little bit, even though we already did one a long time ago. He's awesome. I have great pictures if I find a slide scanner for you. We put him in uh, the crib of Justin Wiegand, my other filmer's child. And we have all these photos, and we always call it his girlfriend. And they look <laughs> like they're the same age. And this like, kid was like two years old or something. It's great, holding baby dolls. So eventually, you and Tanner move in together. Or you take him under your wing. As far as Tanner is like, we just traveled all of a sudden. So parents, like he's already in Utah and like he's living with a guardian or whatever, but I'm traveling around with them. So they're paying for my gas and food and shit like that. So that was my living. You know, I had money for myself to pay my rent, moving out of university and shit like this. I had survival. I worked like 40, 80 hours every week. I was fucking making like $45 an hour, like in the summertime as a kid. 
And so like I, I was able to save. So I was able to pay for school, have some stuff, get this stuff. But he allowed me to travel and see everything, his parents. And so we did that. And then if you remember, Tanner kind of disappeared when he was 16. That's when he got kicked out of school. And at that time, I moved back to Minnesota and then my way back in was I held a heart triple air big air event at Highland Hills. And I fucking cold called all my friends. I'm like, you got to come. Like, I got this. Like, I called every ski company, goggles, glasses, skis. I got a product from every person in the world as giveaway. We got like 120 kids, skiers, snowboard from like fucking eight different states. Everything. I was like, what? This is it. But going back to that, like with the fills. So I was just like, I called up Johnny. I'm like, yo, everyone backed out because it was the same weekend as the Johnny Mosley Invitational at Squaw Valley the, the second year. And so like people like Tanner or JT, the people I lived with and traveled, they're like, I got to invite. I got to go to that. You know, it's fucking $30,000 first place. Well, I fucking ended up, I called up Johnny DeCesare and I'm like, yo, man, like I need people. Like, I guess I got Lou back, but he's like, just has to come because of heart and has nothing to do with me really. But I want to get like a, like a niece, another super pro or two. He's like, call the Phils. They're really great. Dion only speaks English. So I call up Dion. I'm like, yo, I know you don't know me, but do you guys want to fly down to Minnesota and promote the sport of skiing? Blah, blah, blah. Like, this is ill. And then he's like, well, let me talk to the other two Phils and like, I'll get back to you. So he calls back the next day. He's like, we'd love to. I'm like, all right, I got your lodging and food. When you come in on a Thursday, like we'll build on Friday. Contest is on Saturday. You can leave on Sunday. If you want to film some rails between while we're staying up and building all that, like we could do that too. And he's like, all right, I can't come, but the other two Phils can come, LaRose and Bellinger. And I was like, wicked, dude. No way. You guys are buying your plane tickets from Quebec to come to Minnesota, promote the sports scheme, December 99. I was like, no way. Stars are aligned. And I knew I was moving in with Holmes and JT and like right after Christmas. And that was kind of my way to start hustling a movie. Okay. So I had a movie concept. Now I didn't, other than I just wanted to make a movie, meet the Phils. Well, the awesome part was the next week they got LaRose and Bellinger both got an invite to Johnny Wellesley Invitational. And then they said, no, we have already committed to this guy in Minnesota and we're not going to back out of our commitment. Their commitment was them to pay money to yeah. come somewhere. Not the chance to go to the biggest event in the sport of our sport and win $30,000 and they're the best. Phil Bellinger just won slope style last year at the U.S. Open. And then he got second in big air. So, I mean, like these guys are the best of the best at the time for this moment. And so I was like, no way, that's character. And then they came, and then we just talked for fucking three straight days, and then made up, I'm like, let's make a movie. You know, I found out what they didn't like about how they were captured the year before, and it wasn't I dug for it, it was natural conversation, because I'm like, I want to film, I'm going to the Tahoe. And then I fucking spent a year and a half selling the idea of royalty, and then we got it out. So is that how it came together in piecework like that, where yeah. you got those dudes down here, you guys filmed a bunch, if you were We didn't even film. Like, they just came out, we hung out in a cat, they didn't sleep at all, we barely ate, they built the three big jumps, like, in snowcats, off the airplane, barely sleep, wake up, I went back to the hotel, built more, like, fucking 120 kids, then they would lap, and they judged at the same time, 120 skiers and snowboarded, and they announced, and did it all, man, and they're just the most grateful humans that you've ever seen in your whole life, and still to this day. So where I was going with all of this is, I'm asking if you ever live with Tanner, because... I heard you were in a living situation where you might have had like a seedy roommate. He was like a weird dude in the basement doing weird shit. Have you seen Like a Lion? Yep. Okay. So in that, one of the persons in the movie says, oh, Eric was living in the basement making, or there was a guy living in his basement. Donovan Power says there's a guy living in his basement making a porno movie. Then it cuts to Eric and he's like, I wasn't making a porno movie. I had a good girlfriend and we liked to video. And Okay. Yeah. No, he had a different roommate. I'm not the Eric. No, I wasn't thinking it was no, you. I lived in that house the next year. I moved in for a year with Pat Fujas. And then we were there for the making of Dubski in 2003 and four. But that was the only year I ever lived in that house with them. And Dubski was an interesting movie. I mean, you work with the Pettits. You work with Kai, Tanner. It's a bigger budget thing, I would think, from the projects that you've had before. It seemed like it. You were able to be more creative. And there's times where people didn't like it. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but I remember, I mean, I remember Rory's part, really. Yeah. It was like as gory as it could be, I feel yeah. like. He killed his girlfriend or something like that? No, it was, um, he caught his girl, yeah, he killed his girl, he caught his girlfriend cheating on her, and then he killed her and ate her heart. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like pretty graphic. We spent two weeks making that segment now, 20 hours a day. Like, there's so many fucking cuts in that one. That was wicked. 
So, yeah, Dubsky. First of all, it's the wickedest shit. It's not the biggest budget. Royalty was like twice the amount. You know, like, I mean, just for that, I mean, we had some video in uh, Dubsky and just the whole idea, it was just hustled more. All the production value was hustled by okay. Shane Nelson, whether going to, you know, lighting houses, they're closed on weekends. You know, so when we shot all our lifestyles shoots, we go to a lighting house wherever we were, Portland, Salt Lake, uh, Reno, and we go on Friday at 4.55 with our biggest list ever that would be worth fucking $30,000. And we'd be like, this is what we need. And they're like, that's... $30,000. And they're like, we got $50. So here's the deal. You can leave all that stuff in there and not make a penny, or you can give it to us for $50 and we'll be here before you open your doors on Monday morning. So everything was hustled at the highest level of fucking like, let's get it on. But, um, point of Dubsky was after four years, five years being in it, I was bugged out in ski movies, how people were judged. So you had one or two lifestyle segments in your individual segment. And maybe you're hiking a pipe and you had a face mask on and you threw your arms to the side and you had a rap song on. And people are like, oh, that guy thinks he's ghetto. So your image is off uh, one visual other than tricks. You know, maybe ski clothing, maybe. And then a uh, song. I'm making entertainment. You know, like ski movies that are entertainment. Skiers are artists as much as they want to be called athletes because what they're creating every day. There's a separation, I feel like. At this time period. Because... They had to create. There was nothing to watch, hit stop, rewind, slow motion. Yep. You had to like really think about how your body would move without the tools of the, like a lot that there is now to watch and actually to learn on safely. And so when I was looking at this, I was like, all right, well, I want to create opinions. You know, I want to be loved or hate because once I'm done this, now, now you're having a digital break in, you know, for movies. And I loved it. I was like, yo, this is making people think about how to make movies. There's more than MSP, TGR, Poor Boys and Level 1. 2004, like, I think if we go back, there was probably like 80. Like, I mean, when I was doing classic ski movies on Inspired TV and I was doing the freeski.no films of the Hobbit brothers and like seeing what was really around in 04 and 05, the wicked, like the world is blowing up because of the availability of digital. So I was like, how do I make a ski movie that I'm creating like alter egos and then make people have an opinion. And if you have an opinion, you're going to remember the shit. And these are all guaranteed great skiers. The skiing is all guaranteed great. But let me make you think if you love or hate this person through the visuals or whatever and make you really hate them or really love them. Because it sucks that these guys are so great without having great opinions about them. And then my highlight story of that whole movie is the fact that SBC skier in Canada wrote a review on it a year after it came out saying it was the worst ski movie ever on a whole page. So I got a whole page of print saying how horrible my movie was a year later after fucking 80 movies were produced again the next year. That was a highlight. And the fact that people would leave during Rory Silva's segment. No ski movie because we are such passionate, small knit community of loving skiing has ever walked out on skiing. I would say the skiing in that movie is great. But it takes the back seat to the personality that you throw into it. And while I won't say it's the worst ski movie ever, I wouldn't put it in my top, any top list. But that's just my personality. But that's awesome. Because at least you can remember it. Because oh, yeah. how many we things have been made in our life that we've been in skiing that aren't remembered? You know, and it's like there's been a lot of unique things. That people have put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears for what they did. And that's why they didn't last so long, some of them. I remember you know, it because it was so fucked up. I remember the Guatemalan Persuader because I felt like it didn't try to manufacture personalities, but it showed a lifestyle and did a good way of doing it, a fun, like... I don't know, the best history piece ever for an hour and a half with every single player in the game, if you want to learn that year. Yeah. So, eventually, our Mata forms, and, you know, you've got K2 and Solomon, I'd say, that are trying new things. I feel like there's people that are innovating people on the twin tip bandwagon. And then Armada comes out and was like, Hey, we're going to be a ski our own thing. Do you have a piece in Armada from the get go? Originally? Yeah. So like when we first started and this goes back to ski movies. So like when I want to make a ski movie, the reason why I believed I should make a ski movie is because I think some things were missing in it. Right. Cause it's not really about reinventing. It's not about inventing the wheel. It's like kind of looking at everything. Cause it's all been done before, even our sport. Right. When I talked to the old people in like the late nineties, they'd be like, Oh, it's just like hot dog it, man. You guys are going to get regulated. And I was like, no, nah, dude, you see the motocross guys, they're breaking their necks every day. They're not getting regulated. And then like, I had every like awesome response to them. Like, fuck you old man. 
But like looking back, it's kind of fun now. You know, 20 years later, it's like they're right on. Where's my tangent here going? Sorry, I was... You're a team manager of Armada, okay, and you're so telling Armada, me the percentage so, that you owned. So with this, when we started it with the movie, when I finished Royalty, like I was finishing, I had some like kind of real big headaches at the very end of editing where I was like, wow, that just really took the fun out of fucking the funnest thing that should take the fun and fun. And like, I was just, so I was looking at it and I had a bunch of relationships from filming the previous three years and whether living beside Boyd Easley yeah, up in Tahoe and then filming with uh, Julian and JP for poor boys movies in like 2000 and traveling with them and living at their places. And then um also with Phil Bellinger and Phil LaRose, because if you ever remember the very first prototype was an AR7 and that AR7 what, with a different eagle with uh, wings that went straight down that looked like a Nazi German eagle before yeah. the production went to the different wings because it looked like a Nazi thing. Do like you that. guys like Jewish people? Who's we guys? Well, the first prototype you were involved in a ski that looked like Nazi Germany. I didn't think it did. I didn't have the opinion, but when we... You just describe it to me as, as something that killed my people. No. So I guess like when um, there's an eagle on the bottom of the AR-5 or whatever, you know what I mean? The classic one, the first one that came out and then they reissued 10 years later. Well, the wingspan looked more like, I guess, an eagle that someone said looked like it. I never thought it. I just thought it looked like because our die cut was more wicked too. Okay. Because of the wings even was like more sliced and like everything about the Eagle is epic compared to the wings that were solid and put out. But that ski was called AR7. So the first graphic we ever printed and the way we created it was AR7. And that was because of Phil Bellinger and Phil Rose. And then they ended up getting a pro model deal from DSTAR because DSTAR heard about it, that they were getting pulled towards Armada. And then they got the deals of their life. And so... Then they went and got pro models for three years. What's the deals of their life? What do you think those guys? Probably, I guess probably at 50,000 and then guaranteed pro model, 50,000 salary and then pro models and travel for them at that time, because they were the only crew of the first round that weren't paid. So imagine in 2001 too, why they want to be part of it. I mean, you had JP Eau Claire in 2002, probably making a hundred thousand to 200,000 from Solomon for skis, boots, bindings, clothing. Then you had them as the poster child for Oakley. So, and then JF, Rip Curl was like a hundred thousand. Like, so you had all these guys. Uh, Tanner didn't make the big money, but where the fills were beside Vinny, JF, JP, they were beside all these guys that were in six figures mm-hmm. and they were low, low of five. And so all of a sudden they finally got, they're like, wow, that's what we're branded with. These people like us. They've taken care of us. Phoenix was their lifesaver in life, but yeah, no, a deal of their life was different than, cause everyone was different cause no one talked about it. Right. Yeah. So I guess it all started end of that movie. Like I had all these relationships. And so my role in our motto is kind of, once again, when people told me what they didn't like about ski movies and where their place, my friends were telling me what they didn't like about their ski brands. So whether it was dealing with Boyd and Rosignol, you know, Tanner, like dealing with him too and hearing everything. And he was later. Actually, Yoon was around first in the concepting before then. And then Yoon's parents were like, no, nah, you just got paid. You're not going to do something startup. And then we're like, oh, fuck. And then we're like, well, you know, go after Tanner. So, yeah, my role in Armada was just getting these guys together because I kind of was living with everyone on the couches and then saying, you know, shut the fuck up and do it. Let's get the team organized. And then you have a percentage in the company. I have. But that's like, as you know, they got sold a year ago. Everyone got diluted. This is a great story. Yeah, I'm curious. I mean, original investors, I believe, reinvested one or two more times. So for sure, shares are diluted, right? Yeah, because I heard a couple of years ago Armada was having problems. That's why they sold. Yeah, and then new investor group of investors came in in the late 2000s. And then they probably, I'm guessing, diluted all shares. You know, so I'm guessing by that time, like, but I mean, like, this is something that I learned in business too. And like, from not knowing business as a, I was 21. It doesn't seem like your forte. No, it's not at all. Like, especially as a, imagine that though, tw- I was 21. JP was 22. He was the oldest, which, and so was JF. And JF wasn't really part of any of the planning or anything, came on last minute. And then Julian, too. Julian's my age, so he's 21. Fucking Tanner is 18. Boyd's 19. That's our fucking crew. And then O'Connell, who's probably mid 20s. And we all have to figure it out, you know, like how to like build a company structure on how investments can happen and know that reinvestments have to happen and uh, secure your positions. So it's fun now as you grow, grow older to look back. But everyone was like, hell yeah, a change is needed. We all in. Fuck yeah. Let's change the game. 
still, I'm just trying to figure out when this company sold, do you own a piece no, of it? No, I think it was all diluted. No one got paid. Everyone lost money. Original investors lost all their investment. I think the new investors lost their money on the buyout because it said debts were whatever in the online articles. So uh, Atomic made out like bandits? Fuck yeah. Well, whoever owns Atomic. The Amher Sports. Amher Sports Sports made out because all the debt was to them. So they absorbed the debt that was owed to them for production. And then they owned the company and then did, and then paid nothing out. So they have the money that was paid was absorbed by themselves. And I guess this is weird. I just thought of it. There was a guy who I look at as the guy who was responsible for changing Atomic the first time, although he has a much deeper history in skiing. But Jordan Judd, he helped change Atomic. And then didn't he go to Armada for a while? He was, but he, I always thought of him as a line guy because he was a line skier, yeah. worked with line, and then he was Armada. And then I think he went to a time, like he was very short with Armada. It was, I think, two years in the late 2000s. But I thought he went from Atomic to Armada and then back to Atomic. Very possible. I don't know. I kind of lost track in like the late 2000s where I was just like, all right, as soon as clothing happened. It wasn't about being a company of legends, you know, and then the, like the only selling point was like, oh, we're family and doing this. But it's what like you could see the team. I mean, yeah, we were diverse before, but it was still cha- like not champions. It's wrong to say, but creators, you know, and people that were trying to do something different. And so as the company had to grow and learn where it fit in and get excited about outerwear, where, which has to be the most scariest thing in a seasonal thing. I can't imagine ever making out a word. Make or break a company. Yeah. The thing I learned in most in life when I meet some people around the world, they're like, I mean, even my wife, like people in Denmark, she might be like, oh, I'm, oh my name is Mrs. Iberg, whatever. Tell a story to her there. They know about skiing. They're like, oh, you're so you're rich. And then it's like, what? No one knew inspired was Eric Iberg with a laptop living like on a floor, you know, but it, like it's perception, I think, in skiing, you know, it's about this hobby. And the idea of like how you can make things look really good. So Armada's success was being able to survive as long as it did and have the ability to be cool enough to be bought even. But financially, if you're doing business, it's probably the worst idea ever that's ever made in business could be done. So the Monopoly better own you. Well, I'm looking at my notes here and the way that you go on tangents really isn't good (laughs) for me making them through my notes. So I'm just seeing what parts of your life I'm going to cut out because they're not important anyway. No. There's a lot of those, but there's not. Yeah, there are. But like a lion, Tanner's movie, your movie. I mean, if you look at his skiing and, you know, I'm going to have a podcast with him at some point. But I guess if you're to do your three top skiers, I mean, to me, I think you can start out with like the hot dog guys. They kind of created the path for Tanner and everyone to exist. So they're like the grandparents or great grandparents. Then Plake and Schmidt come along. They kind of carry that torch even further to where, wow, you can really just not do anything but ski and make some money. And that makes them the grandparents. Then you have like the McConkies, the Morrisons, even the new Canadian Air Force. They're like changing the game and then are legendary. But if you look at the best three skiers of all time, in my opinion, just based on skiing, not marketing, not emotionally or anything. I mean, I can eat. I think everybody's kind of in that realm. But then I'd put Tanner in right there at number two based on the way he could ski contests, the way he could ski urban, the way he can ski big mountain. You can do them all in the top 1%, which is really hard for people. And I'd say Sammy's in that realm, too. You're saying of all time right now? You're putting these three humans as the all time? In terms of ski ability yeah, and different categories of skiing, I mean, you could put Seth and Sammy on a big mountain line yep. that's Seth's realm, but Sammy's still pretty good. I think you named the three people. I mean, all of them have proven themselves in, in Over 20 urban years. competition, big air, slope style. I mean, the only thing Sammy probably hasn't done is half pipe. Well, that's why so, he's number three in my yeah. list. And I think like the Tanner Candide thing, the only reason Candide is there is because of the world free ride tool, which makes him a real skier. Other than that, it's all debatable and personal. Oh, for sure. Because like, it's so fun. Like, no, I I love the conversation because I always bug out on people's passion. And this goes back to creating ideas of making people like you or hate you. And this is maybe where it backfires in Tanner's life. Not purposely set, but why people might hate him. Where it's like, think what he did. He three-peated in two sports. Candide only won like, 
those sports once, you know, like slope style and half pipe or mm-hmm. Tanner three peated and the movies too, like the quantity of movies, like the creation of movies, like, yeah, Candy did the is creation of things, but then it's now because we're in a popularity contest world, you know, totally. And so I always bug out because like, I love it. Like where you'll love Candy. If you want to hate someone, Tanner's the best person to hate. And then when you have these two awesome humans that are so fucking good at what they do, like, and you're looking at them, we're like, well, I've never heard that guy talk, actually. I love him. And it's like, he's wicked. There's such polar opposite humans in life. It's great. I would say the difference between me watching those guys, especially when they were younger, is if they hit, like, a big quarter pipe, I'd be like, holy shit, when Tanner hit it. And then when Candy did, i just kind of smile and laugh and shake my head yeah. at the same time. Yeah, and Candy does have that beyond wow factor. Like, where you just want to sit, like, yeah, how many times did we drop our jaw and go, what the fuck, wow. And that's, like, crazy. That's the kind of shit Shrobs can do, the wow, but, like, he, he brought wow factor to fucking dopeness. Like, that was unbelievable. So who's your top? I don't know my top. Like, I only have, like, friend favorites, and so it's not fair because, like... Well, these aren't friend favorites. Sammy hates yeah. me because I did a podcast with him where some people didn't speak so favorably about him, and I brought it up, and... He doesn't like me, and he, I don't think he ever will again, although he is nice enough to me when he's telling me he doesn't <laughs> like me in person. So that's cool. Yeah, they're not friend favorites. It's just... No, I'm saying stuff. for me. Like, I don't know because, like, I just... I've always kind of, kind of followed what I love. So if it's just my crew or whatever, like, I can only consume so much. And I have, like, old school favorites. You know, when I was a, straight a fan instead of kind of, like, someone who wants to create the same thing I'm watching somehow. But I don't know. I just have favorites. I mean, I look at everyone I got to work with. And they're like, I mean, look what Kai has done since he's little. Look what Tanner's done since he's little. Look what all the Phils did in creation. Look what Eric Pollard did. And like one of the coolest things too for me making ski movies was, was I was one and done with people. So when I finished royalty, that set up for Playhouse films. They made five movies. When I did dub ski, that set up Tanner. And then he went on to do his movies. Actually, with Shane the next year, not me. Pop Your Bottles. So then Tanner went on to be a movie guy and then I did idea and then Nimbus was created. So the whole idea was more of making people quit what made their life easy, showing up and fucking do it and whatever, and then complaining about it. And it made them work more and spend a lot more money and, and then fucking create ill shit for themselves. Well, I like that you dropped that timeline because it's a lot of the stuff that I'm going to skip over, but all very influential things. But the most recent influential thing that we'll talk about is you had Inspired Media. It was right around when you put out Like a Lion. You and Tanner have this company. And I guess what I really want to know about the company, because it's since shut down. And I think it was when did it shut down? Uh, January 2017. Okay. And you guys had everything. You had like TV shows, edits, movies, events, clothing. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of different things that you had. And... To promote it, you had everything as well. I mean, you had Tanner, B-Dog, Henrik. You had Olympic medals, exposure. You had the Wu-Tang. All these things that are going in your favor. You have a great name and a vision. And then how does the door shut? Because I mean, I have my philosophy. My philosophy is you had a little bit of everything, like I said before. And you didn't focus on one thing. You focused on like 30 things. And if you would have focused on one thing with a salesy type thing to it, you could have generated revenue to keep going. But that's me from the outside. I don't know you, but I've gotten to know you a little more. I feel even more strongly about that. That's everyone's opinion. It's awesome. That's why I smile so big if you can't see. But, you know, like the biggest thing is I created life randomly, you know, on the other side of the world. And then I had to take care of it, right? Because everything you saw, I was all from 2010 to 2012. So all the foundation I did that you saw from 2012 to 2016, and in 2016 was all the fucking network I was able to do and basis when I didn't have life to support on the other side of the world. You know what I mean? And if I'm running the show, what I made that comment earlier about someone thinking I'm rich, but it's really me with a laptop. These are all connections that I had from the previous 12 years of life. Whether it's the soundtracks I'm doing, whether it's the movie tours, music tours, even like the record label down in Jamaica. And it wasn't about spreading yourself too thin because everything flowed. Everything was able to pay for each other. I created a menu. So when I went to someone just like a distributor that has 50 brands, I had 50 fucking things they could pick from. And then they got to pick from and say I couldn't get fucking 100,000 for one thing and how I'd normally do if I focus for something. 
I could go get that hundred thousand dollars and spread it out. But all those things marketed inspired. Everything was an inspired event, a B and E invitational, a Tanner Hall invitational, a fucking inspired TV, inspired radio, inspired TV shows, like everything. And then everyone that worked with me was maybe like 800 people that we had a relationship with over the previous 12 years. I mean, I did 200 inspired TV shows with unprofessional production crews. I made the Minnesota Represent show. I had a homies, fucking a homegrown Tahoe Buds. The Austrian show, Japanese show, fucking, I had like six different countries. They all hit deadlines, all hit timelines, bought cameras, learned how to edit just to promote their culture because they were all icons like the Minnesota Represent show. I got to show a Zach Mertz show. Zach Mertz is more famous than Tanner Hall at Highland Hills because he's been there for 40 years and he's the best. So he's in a show. So my icons all over the world were my equal where you say Tanner, Phil and Henrik. Like they were equals with every, all 800 other people I worked with. And we all knew that. And the whole idea was Wu-Tang on crack. Let's get a different person from a different part of the world. We all work together and like we promote each other. And if we're all promoting each other, Henrik releases something, everyone's fucking promoting Henrik. Tanner's releasing something, everyone is. And then it was cool and vice versa. They could like hype the younger guys or the smaller guys, even if they weren't trying to make it, it still made those local people fucking be this even more famous than they were. I feel like you were diluting your market completely by just spreading people out. Totally, but it was a 10-year plan plus. It wasn't a get-rich-quick scheme. And the goal is when you can make people see things visually or hear, have them here through our, our uh, music company and stuff, that way I could do it. It's not physical things I'm having people touch. I'm having them consume visual and audio things. So I'm building up a market of Inspired. Well, you built a brand of Inspired where I think if you had more inspiration to create some things that were tangible for people because you had like hoodies and stuff and you get some inspired i didn't want to make fucking product i had fucking everyone i gave my business card look at me and be like your logo so dope you should make that and then some fucking guy in fucking austria was like can i make a bunch of shit for you and i'm like i don't have any money to make shit so most some things like that if you want to get into like just looking at merchandising it wasn't, there was no plan to get into it. It wasn't get done, but I can tell you put an extra fucking 5,000 a month into the company that was never planned on or thought of other than the logo being say cool logo. And then someone saying, I'll pay for everything and send you money. Yeah. So anything that you saw where outside opinion says that wasn't executed. Well, that probably wasn't even cared about. That's no longer around. And now it's kind of been to another movement. We're on the Powell movement, but you have the inspired movement. And to me, who looked at it for five minutes and did some research on it, it's a hemp-based company. You're a weed guy. It makes sense. It's something you've probably always cared about, no matter what else is going on in your life. Like, that never lets you down unless you couldn't find any or you were taking a break. And now you're going to go on on hemp-based products. So it's like you have a distribution center. You have an online store. And you're going to use the inspired brand that you've created change the name a little bit, and it's going to be the inspired movement, and the movement's going to be about hemp-based products. Is that the vision? In a nutshell, with the weed thing and stuff, it was a inspired movement when I knew I was, say, like when I was halfway through Be Inspired. So 2015, I knew inspired media wasn't going to happen. You know, I knew inspired music wasn't going to happen. I knew I still love music, so I still, still to this day do a bunch of shit with music. With media, I was like, all right, I'm still inspired. You know, like, what the fuck do I do? So, like, kind of brainstormed some ideas, made a logo, did all this. So, it evolved so many ways over two years. Well, even while I was looking for other jobs and trying to find other jobs and do this. And so, it evolved into this thing where, whether it was research, because originally I wanted to start a company that, because it's like, who wants a fucking t-shirt company? Who needs another logo on them? And, like, uh, my whole thing is, like, I looked into, like, working for foundations and it's, like, corporate ladder that you have to climb and... I just was like, how do I give and support at the same time? Get like as a job, be able to help other people, but at yeah. the same time, make money to <laughs> pay for my family to live. And so that it was a dead end road. And so like in structuring the company, I was just always in my dreamland. I was like, well, I found like certain companies that were given 50% of their profits, you know, it'll help certain things. So I was angry. I'm like, that's the movement. You know, the movement is helping other people. And then like getting into biodegradable and plant-based stuff, like, I was looking into that and then that bugged me out. And then like, there was a bunch of shit that happened and it evolved over two years. But I mean, even with inspired stuff, like all of a sudden last fall, when I was still trying to figure shit out, 
Phil Bellinger calls up. He's like, yo, I got like 60 extra hoodies. Like, what if I put an Inspired logo on it and just sold it? I'm like, dude, like, I'm not about selling shit. He's like, dude, and he's been poking me. Like, since I shut the doors in January 2017, he's like, can I keep selling your shit? You'll, I'll get, I'll send you thousands every month. Well, someone who's good at that sales stuff, which doesn't seem like to be your forte. And I don't mean to be rude by saying that. No rudeness. They can make some money off of it. Especially, I mean, you, you have the best athletes in the world representing the brand. They still want to represent what you're doing because they like you. And they help build this thing and build the name. And they know there's potential in it. But... That is for you to figure out. I think if you're going to make some products, focus on one or two hemp-based products. Well, I'll just put it like this. Like, where it's going to, it was a transition year. I needed a way to, like, fucking get a source of income. And I had a fan base that still wanted something. Yeah. So I applied that to survive in life. And then I said, you know what? That fan base, some of them might be interested in what I'm doing, but I don't like hyping myself. You, you know, have to. I know, but I, so I don't want to make my... The reason why some people don't hear me is I always wanted to be the guy behind the curtain in Wizard of Oz. That was my dream and scheme. I'm like, how do I be the guy behind the curtain? Like, I want to be part of something everyone thinks that's awesome or cool. I don't want to be the guy they say, Eric made that happen, or tell people I made it happen. And so, like, I want to do the same thing in whatever I'm going. So... It's a very big transition year and I'm making it visual for someone like for you to see or someone else that sees that knows me or knows what I'm doing and where it's brought me in the last two months from interested because I've gone nuts in the hemp world, like nuts from biofuel in Costa Rica to talking with people in hemp plastics in Italy about like making biodegradable hemp plastic ski boots to like, and that's my only ski relation. Don't that. get into the ski business. I, I won't, but I'm saying, coal, like, this is collab one billionth of the business. Like, whatever, it's no investment. Like, assist in bringing hemp and biodegradable plant sustainability. You know, like, we're helping the world and helping people as two elements that I focus on, like, if I'm going to create something from here out in, out in life. So where it's brought me today is I'm pretty fucking stoked and just look for the word inspired. And if you see it on the regular, hopefully in some weird thing like you know where it came from and that's like i'll never stop being inspired so i'll keep creating new shit you just have to see it visually and those that are listening i will be heavily editing this on all of his answers so there are some tangents here which is why we are going to go right into inappropriate questions and this is the part of the show where i am going to ask you three questions why because we figured out we we're going to do this yesterday i'm in minnesota today and I have three things that I want to know that we really didn't bring up in the podcast, and I hope you're comfortable talking about weed, are you? Yes. Okay. So It's the first time ever you say, you know, visually or audio, but you get it. First time I talk or show about weed, because you've never seen a picture of me smoking weed. I've never seen a picture of you smoking weed, but I've always been told I'd like you, and the truth is, I do. You seem like a good dude. <laughs> Thanks, man. This is like a blind date. I emailed you out of the blue saying, hey, I'm coming to your town. I'm going to invite myself over to your place. And we are now in your two high school buddies dungeon. And over the years, whenever you've come up in conversation, everybody's like, hey, you'd really like this dude. And this dude smokes a ton of weed. I've heard that enough consistently that I want to know what a ton of weed is. So in your prime, and you have two children now, so you don't have the time to commit to marijuana as much anymore but how much would you smoke in a day week and month just ballpark figures a quarter a day yeah that sounds maybe right so a quarter a day yeah because i mean even like when i got my weed prescription right so i figured out an angle in tahoe so it's like 2005 six so i moved there got all my stuff got a, a subscription or prescription from a lawyer and or a doctor in oakland i got um 10 plants you can grow. Signed it over. My grower could grow three pounds per plant. So 10 plants are six pounds. Grower would give me six pounds for free. And then he would go sell the rest of the pounds for New York for fucking 12,000 a pound. <laughs> so there's always an angle is what I'm saying. Because like it's tough to, I can't wait to live somewhere where I can grow up in my backyard. So to put a number on it financially, it's unfair. You know, when you're looking at how much someone smokes. You know, like, even when we went on tour, it was the most funnest shit. Like, how many people just came up with jars of fucking mass quantities of weed. And you're just like, what? We can just smoke all day and night. This is great. So if you're saying a quarter a day, uh, because that's like what a college kid would smoke in two weeks. But if you're rolling spliffs, which is, I believe, the way you smoke them, you're probably going to get 
10 out of a quarter. Sounds okay. right. That's it? More. Because like what I remember writing down how I medicated myself when I went to the doctor in Oakland. And then it was on three hour intervals. And I'd, on three hour intervals, I'd write two to four spliffs because they had to figure out how much to prescribe you for your pain. So we're talking double that then, half ounce a day. Yeah, maybe if possible. You know, so, it's about possibilities here. I'm just going to say if it's a half ounce a day. That's ridiculous talk. It's ridiculous. Two ounces a week. That's like that in a height. Like now you can't. I'm talking about the peak. peak. The ultimate peak. Two oh. ounces a week. And that makes it. I don't think two ounces a week is pretty That gnarly. makes it eight ounces a month. So you're going through like a pound of weed every two months? I don't know. I just. Because it was always group stuff too. Like every group that you did. So like you, you get quantity. I mean, we went on trips and then I remember going to Jackson Hole and like having it flown up in peanut butter jars because it was like 600 an ounce or something in Jackson in fucking 2004. 600. So now if you had to <laughs> guess the money that you spend in it, because you say it's not fair. It is fair. You just have to well, not it is, but no, I'm just saying the balance. If you yeah. just add it up. The like amount a- versus the money is different. You're paying less over time per gram of weed than anybody else is because you've gotten bulk deals over the yeah. time. But how much do you think you've spent in smoking weed in your lifetime? Let's say 20 I started. So I'm 38. You know, as far as like a consumer, even 21 was real because I was after the fills because it's with the fills every day. So I'm going to be 22. Let's say 22 real consumer. 16 years. So 16 years. Let's Now let's uh, break it down. Let's say paid on average over that time, 300 a month average out. So now we're going 300 times 12. So th- you're at 3,600 bucks a year. That's not that bad. No. And that's what I'm saying. Like, if I look at the average on times when I see how it comes in and what it goes, like, I mean, even like you go down to Jamaica, like you're going to get like fucking three fucking ounces for $10, you know, like it's got seeds in it, but like it's got three ounces. You fucking smoke it up. Question number two, what's the sketchiest drug related situation you've ever been in? I'm sure you've seen some shit in your day. So it's drug related or just scary related? I guess scary related. I guess Kingston, like if I look at real scary is Jamaica, but at the same time it was comfortable, but just like to know what was happening because you were white, because you were foreign and you're known to be foreign, you kind of like get a protection because it brings attention from the outside. If you fuck with you, you know what I mean? Like, so I can walk down a super ghetto place. And if I'm a foreigner, that person who like runs the block or runs that area is not going to fuck with you because they're like, wow, I already own this part of life. If I fuck with you, someone from outside's coming. Yeah. I don't want it. And so it was kind of a bizarre feeling, but to be able then to enter areas, maybe you wouldn't have a pass like here in Minneapolis if you don't know someone. Mm-hmm. And I always knew someone. Never gone anywhere in life without knowing someone. But um, that was the gnarliest place. Like, I mean, like, decide not to go to a party and then you're like, oh, that guy got murdered last night or talking about a producer going over to their studio and then like that guy got murdered. And like, it was just, I think, in real life, to be part of that, like go out down there for a month and then you're up like 20 hours a day and just the studios all night and then making movement. And you're the only white guy and you're just a walking fucking thousand dollar bill to every human. Like that part is wild. Like it feels more than a piece of meat. But I didn't feel scared ever. I loved it, actually. But it was the most interesting part that I think humans would think was scary. So I've never been scared, I don't think. Like <laughs> I'm more scared about my friend killing himself in front of me and I don't do enough. Like, if I ever crashed my car with a famous skier and I'd be like, wow, then everyone would blame me and no one would love me. That's scary. All right. So, I think those are my three questions. I think I asked you about how much you smoked in a day, week, and month. But we really got to the thing that you you smoke a half ounce of weed a day. And that's a lot. But then we asked about cost. And then the cost is a little. For a half ounce of weed a day, most people would spend 15 to 20 grand. And the fact is that balances out. You know, it goes back to the you know surroundings you know like where i was in life what you're doing sometimes is payment you know sometimes your friend like if you're fucking driving them everywhere if you're fucking doing this or that you know what is an ounce of weed and speaking of payment what toll is it taking on your brain because based on everything i've ever heard in my life it affects your short-term memory has it I think the only thing it allows me to do is not care about like the little things as much. And especially now as like a father, like there's so many little things that don't matter 
And like that, when I try to quit or like I take a break or something, like I've only had positives that I know. The short term's not there. Like I have 50 notebooks for all my shit that I'm doing as far as business. Now, am I overloaded because there's 50,000 apps for fucking everything from bank accounts to school procedures? And then their fucking login registers don't work. And then I have to sit on phones and then they say they're sorry. And I spend half a day dealing with modern society. Give thanks for weed. Well, you seem like a positive person all around and loving everything that has gone on in your life. It was a great run in the ski world. And it's a run that now is heading into the hemp world, which is related to the weed world, which is related to my inappropriate questions. But I want to thank you for your time. I feel like I'm back in time. It's like I'm back in college. Here's some more records. And what do we have here? Crystallis? I don't even know what that is. Maybe they don't either. Maybe they just like the look of records. No, no, this is real. They have book on the music and tons of records. So these guys play video games. They play guitar. They're the shit. Yeah. And while they're at work, you are at their house doing what they wish they could be doing. Well, but they would be playing video games or guitar. Normally, I'd be working nonstop, and I consider this help of work of a friend. So that was time with Eric Iberg, and this dude has so much history in the ski world, and it seemed like he blazed his own path, learning from his mistakes and creating a lot of gold in his time in skiing. It will be interesting to see what he does in the future, as he's one of those guys that has solid ideas and can make them happen. He's also one of those guys who would benefit a ton by aligning himself with someone to handle all of the day-to-day business operations so he can create. While Eric has run some successful projects, he's a creative. And over the years, I've found that creative minds like his find much more success when they have a person taking on that suit role. Regardless, Eric Eiberg is on a new journey, and this journey involves hemp. It's something that he knows a lot about. Next week, I will have another awesome guest on the show. I'm not going to say who it is, because really, I'm not 100% sure. While I have a schedule, some people get too busy for me or blow me off after committing, and those are my problems, not yours. And while you can't solve my guest dilemma, you can help me out by reviewing me on whatever platform you listen to me on. If you're on an iPhone, it takes a minute, and here's what you need to do. Go to podcast on your iPhone or iTunes, search the Powell Movement, scroll down to where you see the stars, hit five stars, and you're done. It makes a big difference, and thank you so much for doing it. Finally, I want to thank my sponsors for making this show possible. They are Evo, Rescue Water, and the 10 Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.